Here's how to practice two important watercolour skills. Wet and wet, that's in the background, and then how to successfully paint a layer on top. Excellent practice for any watercolour artist at any level. And I've taken the exercise from this book called Watercolour for the Absolute Beginner. And then I've put my own spin on it by taking an image that I have of a tree and painting my version of a tree on top. It's an Australian tree. Uh, this is what the exercise looks like. Uh, that's the double page and that's where it starts. Uh, the background is really simple and easy to do. Yellow, add red, then add purple. So they have a beautiful color combination suggestion. And then you could, if you had this book, follow this actual tree or you could do what I did and get your own image of a tree and put your own spin onto this exercise. So this is an exercise that's about two layers and I'm just putting the book aside there, you'll see. So that I don't splatter it. It's it's quite an interesting book. Um, I'm keen to do a review of that art book. Um, I just haven't got around to it as yet. I'm using a really big spray bottle so that I can quickly cover the page. That's just about speed. Nothing to do with uh, effects at all because in fact I get my mop brush and smooth out all that water so that then I don't have any little tiny bits of white paper popping through and I get this incredibly smooth mix happening. You can see on my palette that I've already prepared a puddle of alizarin crimson and I had also prepared in the little well a puddle of cadmium yellow, cadmium yellow pale in fact. So you paint in stripes, big stripe of yellow, and you go straight in with the alizarin and you're mixing color on the page. So you could mix it on the palette if you wanted to, but it, I just love that alchemy when the uh, second color comes down and mixes in on the page. And I love the way that one color moves into another. And you'll find that that red is so gonna dominate that yellow really, really quickly. I love that movement you can see there with the red pushing into the yellow. So because I don't want actual stripes on the page that you can see, I tilt my page and uh, get all the paint to run um, into each other. So uh, I've done now steps one, two and three and they recommend now that you add a bit of purple. So I'm just turning the page of the X of the book to get to steps, uh, step four. The blue I'm adding in is cobalt hue, co cobalt blue hue, and I mix it with alizarin for a fabulous looking purple. And into a lot of the spaces, really, I add the purple. And I'm still doing stripes, but because I'm moving quite quickly, the page is still beautifully wet. And so when I lift and tilt the page, the purple gently floats into the other layers and you get a beautiful background that you can't tell was originally painted in stripes. I hold it on this angle for a little while, I reckon a couple of minutes, um, watching the paint flow from one, one stripe into another. I don't want to see any of the striations. Um, but I don't want to lose any of the pure color either. So it's just a matter of sitting with it and literally watching your paint uh, dry because it's starting to dry already being watercolor. And I really quite find, I really find this part relaxing just watching it um, paint, uh, move about like that. So I grab my hairdryer. This is actually a heat gun and that speeds up the process so that I can move into the next step which is to paint the tree on top. It re You really want it completely dry, that's one of the best tips I can possibly give you before you paint the next layer on top. You really get your control back. So you can see there I've gotten an image of my own. I have hundreds of images of trees. I absolutely love Australian trees and every time I go anywhere I take lots of photographs. I'm going to be painting the tree trunks in a grey and I'm taking that 
beautiful purple that I'd mixed with uh, cobalt blue hue and alizarin and then I'm slowly adding really small amounts of yellow and I found that just adding it with my paintbrush was taking too long so I grabbed a pipette there sucked some up and I am neutralizing that purple and turning it into a purple kind of gray I'm using the mop brush to paint the tree trunk first and I'm trying mostly to stare at my photograph and focus on where those beautiful branches go, the directions that they go. I'm using the belly of the brush for the really fat parts of the trunk and then reverting to the tip. So just moving the brush on to a taller angle, a more uh, perpendicular angle um, so that I get thinner marks towards the top of the branches. I do switch to a smaller brush uh, in a moment too. You can see in that background that partly because I tilted the paper and partly because I got my heat gun out in time that I have no backgrounds and um, so that makes that background look so incredibly beautiful. So I'm still painting with this neutralized purple, which is in fact a complementary gray. When you add purple to its complement yellow, it's referred to as a complementary gray. And if you get that balance just right, it is the most beautiful way to mix a gray. I avoid whipping out uh, tubes of grays that you can buy. There's heaps of different grays you can buy. Um, Davies gray, Payne's gray. I like to mix my own grays. It's one of those wonderful things that you learn through color theory is how to mix your own grays. So this painting I'm just taking my time and painting in quite a relaxed way where, with the mop brush. You can also see that I'm holding my hand quite a fair way up the uh, handle of the brush and this means that I have less control and it means that the marks are a little more natural looking rather than being uh, too contrived. I really enjoy holding the brush up at that angle. So I'm switching there to a quill. It's a smaller brush. It's a bit like a round brush. A quill has a really beautiful point and that point allows me to get thinner branches and I'm kind of filling in on some of the bits where I want to expand some of those trunks where I didn't really like how lumpy I'd made the trunk because I was using the mop brush first. The mop brush is definitely a more crude uh, instrument to use. So I was just pointing to the image there to say this is where I'm moving to next, one of the other branches. It's quite um, an excellent exercise in that you are ignoring perspective. You're not at all concerned with the form of the branch. You're just focusing on how to get that paint down without going over and over and over the trunks. So I'm trying very much to get the one stroke method, go in, get the background layer down and then try to not be overpainting it. Uh, having said that, I do, you can see me overpainting it uh, there, but that's really not the goal. Your goal is not to disturb the layer underneath. So this might be one of these examples where you kind of half ignore what I'm doing there because your goal is not to disturb the layer underneath. Your goal is to get that layer of paint down, the second layer of paint down and try not to go back and forth. Because once you paint the layer on top, you start to moisten the layer underneath. I think partly because the trunks are so dark, you won't be able to tell where I have disturbed the layer underneath. So that's probably why I'm getting away with it. Ideally though, if you're painting a layer upon another layer of watercolor, you get that layer down and you don't go over and over it. Oh dear, I'm going over it again. I felt that it wasn't dark enough. I think because I'd allowed the mop brush just to run out, it wasn't dark enough. So I'm just going back into the wet trunk and adding more paint. The mop brush, the beauty of the mop brush is that it holds so much paint you can just go and go and go without having to reload. And you can see me 
using the tip when I want to let some more of the paint go into the big trunk. It's important to remember at all times that this is an exercise. My um, latest mantra is that I, you are not painting a masterpiece. And I like to say that to myself, Marion, you're not painting a masterpiece, you're painting an exercise. You've got to take the pressure off yourself when you're painting, particularly in watercolour. It's really uh, a skill that you need to practice over and over and over. I absolutely love watercolour for how much there is to constantly learn. I quite love that you need to practice and then you practice again. And if you paint and remember to, that this is just an exercise, you do take the pressure off yourself. It is a great way to be thinking, look, it's just an exercise. Don't be hard on yourself and enjoy the motion of going back and forth. At this point, I thought to myself, oh, I wonder if I could give these trunks a bit of form. So I pick up the flat brush and I begin removing some highlight on the left-hand side of the trunks. And I quickly realized that I was painting an exercise. And even though you'll see me try for another second, I go back in and just paint back over where I lifted off. And I say to myself, this is just an exercise. Just enjoy painting this simple tree. I find that if you work on ways to take the pressure off yourself, then you can relax a little more, you enjoy the painting process more, and so often you get a better outcome. It's impossible to say whether or not the Willembrinks used a resource when they painted their tree, um, because they don't tell you in the exercise. But I do find that having um, an image to refer to really makes my uh, any sort of painting whether it's an exercise or not it definitely makes my paintings look more convincing I find that if I'm making trees up just making it out of my head those trunks would not have had those beautiful um, back and forths I wouldn't have crossed over some of the trunks into the other trunks near so much I just love having an, a resource to look at. I'm taking note there of the fact that the Willembrinks uh, use sticks, as in really fine branches that came down into the bottom left-hand corner of the page. And I kind of thought about it and then went, nah, I think I'll stick to the image that I was working from. I don't know whether it was a gum tree, a ghost gum. It could have been an angophora after it's lost all its bark. I'm really not sure, but um, it doesn't matter. The point is that I was going for something that would look convincing as though it really was uh, a gum tree. The other thing that I've done to simplify this as an exercise is completely avoid the foliage. And that way, um, painting those, and that way, painting the trunks and the branches is easier because I'm not having to think at all about the foliage and what that would look like. There's lots of message, uh, there's lots of methods to uh, and ways to apply foliage, but I was focusing on the simplicity of the exercise in the Willem Brunk Brinks book. Please put a comment below if you think you'd like a review of this book by the Willem Brinks. I haven't done that as yet. Um, I've owned the book for a long time and it's quite interesting. It, the authors are Marth, Mark and Mary Willembrink and it's an interesting book. It comes with a CD, which really is a little bit useless, uh, and only has Mark Willembrink uh, demonstrating for my recollection. It's been a good couple of years since I've watched the CD, but um, that's partly why I bought the book because it came with a CD. So here I am uh, taking a moment to go, right, am I finished? It's worth standing back from your image to decide whether or not it's done. And I'm going to say that it's done. And this was just an exercise. Stop. Enjoy the process. Know that you've done a good job. Know that you've spent time practicing your skills, honing your skills. That's a wonderful thing to do 
on its own as well. So thank you so much for joining me. Please give me a thumbs up if you got anything out of this video and please join me again. I'll put a link down below to the next exercise that would be really good for you to practice next if you're in the mood and that is practicing soft edges. See you guys. Thanks. Bye.